Welcome everyone to uh, NetDev 20. And I hope everybody had safe travels getting here. So uh, today, uh, this is the hardware acceleration and offload uh, workshop. And we have uh, a few presentations, um, but hopefully most of this will be some uh, open discussion. Uh, if you have any agenda items, um, so we had one, uh, one come up for my um, request on the list. If you have any agenda items or uh, questions, uh, start by putting them on the chat. Uh, I think we'll have, uh, we should have plenty of time to um, get to any of those questions. Uh, so we have three, uh, three presenters. Uh, Saeed will talk about XTP hints. Uh, this has been uh, something that uh, we've, we've talked about before. So I'm really looking forward to seeing um, what progress we're making there. Angie will talk about some of uh, the other thoughts on acceleration and offload. I'm going to uh, present a problem in the area I think the community um, can potentially address. Uh, Mache, uh, had a question um, posed in the area of uh, requirements around acceleration. And as I mentioned, uh, we'll we're open to other topics uh, and uh, we'll have an open mic. So one thing I should mention is uh, this work group or workshop is a little bit um, loosely formed. Uh, it was kind of uh, redundant with some of the presentations uh, you might notice uh, clearly there are some other XDP accelerations. So, so bear that in mind, there will be other opportunities um, for discussion along these lines. But the real goal here is to, to be a little less formal than the normal presentations. And I'm hoping we can get some uh, good discussion on where everyone's at. Uh, any questions uh, so far? Okay, so with that, uh, Saeed, are you present? I don't see Saeed, Tom. Okay, uh, Anjali, are you present? Uh, Tom, I think Anjali ha, ha, hasn't died in yet. Okay, so, so let me let me go ahead and start it. Uh, hopefully they're joined. Um, I assume since this is the first session, uh, we're probably having a little bit of a, a learning experience. So bear with me one moment. Okay, so um, I want to talk about something that I've been pondering for a while um, in, in this particular area of accelerations, offloads, the relationship between hardware offload, hardware features, software stacks, uh, smart NICs, and programmable, programmable devices. So I think it's pretty clear that as an industry, we, we want to move in this direction. We, we want to have uh, advanced hardware features. We want to offload a virtual switch and advanced filtering capabilities. And we want it to obviously be uh, highly programmable, extremely flexible, and yet somehow get all the performance and run at hardware speeds. So basically this, whatever number you see there is an end of quarter number. So by the end of quarter, you will have it. I'm sorry, was that a question? No. Okay, so uh, can, can you mute if you're not speaking, please? 
Okay, so here's the, the first question. Um, and this I, I might have raised before, I don't know if, if it was in a context like this. But if you look at what we've really shipped uh, in terms of, of hardware and hardware vendors and NICs, while there has been enormous effort on various forms of offload, in reality, very few of these actually are, are really ubiquitous across almost all the NICs and, and other known favorites. So clearly, uh, transmit and receive checksum offload. This is implemented across a wide variety of NICs. It's been implemented that way for a while. RSS, we've made um, great headway with receive side scaling. So this is really good for reducing or, or improving the load balancing on a multi CPU. TSO is also one, uh, transmit segmentation offload that we've done a good job on. So that's the idea that we take a large uh, TCP packet greater than MTU, break it up into smaller chunks so they can be sent in the NIC. And the advantage there is we get economies of scale because the stack only had to process one packet. There is sort of a, a cognate on the receive side called LRO, large receipt offload. This one's been a little less uh, ubiquitous. I think the obvious reason is that it requires the device to be able to parse packets on receive. And it also requires the um, device to implement some uh, kind of logic about, about this since there is state involved. So in order to do all our own, we need to coalesce packets that are being received. And once we start doing that, that means we have to on a per flow basis collect packets, buffer them, and receive them in the stack. And then, of course, that means we also have to account for the possibility that not all the packets are received. There could be holes, so we have to have timers. And if you follow this, what it means is it's a non-work conserving model. And this is going to be true with, with a lot of the offloads, especially received, and in fact is going to be one of the reasons why uh, it's so difficult to to make offloads ubiquitous. But beyond that, though, there has been some implementations of IPsec, uh, TLS offload is one of the newer ones, obviously. Uh, TC Flower offload has made some progress. Switch Dev. Uh, so all of these are at various levels. I think different vendors uh, push different things. Uh, some of them are useful, but I'm not, it's not clear to me that they're universally useful at this point. And a lot of this has to do with the complexities of, of how do you interact with the host software stack uh, and the device. Some of these have to do with maintaining state in the device and the complexities of that. So for instance, TLS uh, requires a lot of state, especially in receive. So we hit some of those receive problems that I mentioned. So one um, kind of digression before we get into the, the actual problem, I want to make an attempt to clarify the definition between acceleration and offload. A lot of times these seem to be used interchangeably. And uh, previously I had mentioned uh, a, a definition and I wanted to refine that a little bit. So the earlier definition was something along the lines of offload is something that the host stack wants that a device wants to, a device to do. Um, so the device acts on behalf of the offload. And acceleration, uh, the previous definition was that anything that speeds up, um, any offload that speeds up the processing would be considered acceleration. So uh, those devices, those definitions really aren't, aren't great. Um, and I think uh, when we look at the wider problem, if we could distinguish these in a, in a certain way, it might be helpful. So offload, is specifically the host stack request operations um, from the device associated with either the act of transmitting or receiving a packet. And this fits the canonical uh, use of the term offload and, and checksum offload and transmit segmentation offload, TLS offload, where for instance on transmit, we arrange all of the information that 
the device needs in order to do the, the work, for instance, to do the checksum offload, we arrange that a priori. In the case of checksum offload, usually it's just as simple as putting information in the transmit descriptor. Uh, receive is kind of similar on the receive side. When packets are received, the device kind of autonomously performs uh, configured operations such as computing the checksum or decrypting the packet. And all of that happens before it's sent it to the host. And again, when the packet is sent to the host in the receive descriptor, the device indicates what it actually did. So it would indicate, for instance, the, the checksum, packet checksum, if we're doing generic checksum offload. So in both these cases, it's kind of a, a disassociation between the host stack and, and the device. So, if, so on transmit, we create these transmit descriptors and everything that we want the device to do has to be put into that descriptor and the device has to understand it for, for the packet to be sent correctly. So for instance, if we have multiple operations, like we're doing uh, TLS over TCP, we have to do that with the understanding that we're offloading the TLS operation, so that's sort of one command, and then we're offloading the checksum of the TCP, so that's another command. Now, obviously, they, they could be paired together, but we can imagine scenarios where uh, it, it gets more complex like than that. So, for instance, we could have um, RDMA over, T, over uh, IWARP, over TLS, over TCP, over UDP encapsulation. So you could have multiple checksums, uh, multiple encryptions. That could even be over IPsec. Uh, and obviously the hardware can't support all that, but, but the point here is that the perm permutations could become almost combinatorial. And it's up to the device to, to expose the interfaces to which of those combinations can support but it's also up to the host to understand which of those combinations can support. One of the, one of the major problems, and I'll allude to this uh, later on, is that when we have an offload on transmit, the device has to under, or the, the device driver and the host have to understand what the capabilities of the device are very, very precisely. Uh, you can imagine if the host tries to offload a checksum and for whatever reason, the device doesn't understand how to, how to uh, offload that particular checksum. Maybe uh, the packet headers, it doesn't understand and it's doing um, protocol of specific checksum offload. If it doesn't understand that, then the packet cannot be transmitted correctly and we have, we have a bug. So offloads are inherently complicated. Uh, receive side's a little easier because uh, it's optional. So, for instance, if the device can't compute a checksum for a packet, uh, it sends it up to the host and just doesn't provide the checksum information. And the host does the checksum itself. So that's kind of offload. Now, acceleration uh, is a similar respect. The, we have hardware that can perform operations on behalf of the host. But what I propose for acceleration is this is more of an inline uh, data path element. So for instance, in the case of checksum offload, checksum acceleration would be something more like the host stack decides that it needs to compute a checksum. So we want to call a, a function, uh, please do a high performance checksum over this block. And the actual work, for instance, of putting in uh, the checksum into the packet could, could be done in, in the CPU. But the, the expensive operation, which is really what, what we want out of hardware, the transform, that could be done uh, in the hardware. So we have a couple of examples of this. Certainly, uh, the AES instructions and modern CPUs uh, approach this. They, as we get higher, higher and higher, um, vectorized instructions uh, more with, these become more like accelerations than, than just uh, simple CPU arithmetic instructions. Uh, clearly, GPUs are really good at this. Um, the, the programming model is specifically that we, we code up a program that runs in the CPU, but whenever we can, we accelerate uh, 
whatever operations we can, matrix operations. So a matrix multiply, for instance, is, is much easier to do um, in the device, but it's different than offload. We don't, we don't necessarily tell the GPU everything we need to do with this video frame. We can actually program it in steps um, and have the advantages of that. So just think of the difference here as offload is uh, kind of fire and forget. The, the interface between the host and the device is kind of a one-off. Uh, we're transmitting a packet. Here's everything you need to do device. We're receiving a packet. Here's everything I know about this packet. Acceleration kind of breaks it down and can be more granular. Okay, so we want to do uh, this operation. I want to do this checksum. I have a function for that. We want to do this acceleration. I have a function for that. Uh, we want to do this state lookup, have a function for that, uh, hash, et cetera. So it really breaks it down to the elements. So let's look at the um, traditional stack driver device model. I think this is well known. Uh, we have host stacks that uh, Linux, DPDK, uh, obviously FreeBSD, Microsoft, everybody has sort of this model. Uh, usually there's a common API into device drivers. So the advantage there is, since it's common, that we can write one networking stack that works with a whole bunch of different devices because the driver basically forms an adaptation layer. And the role of the driver is to convert the, that common API into device-specific uh, commands and information. And a typical model that's done over the PCIe bus and a proprietary <clears throat> API into the device. So in this model, the driver exposes, on the north side, exposes uh, interfaces to the host, with those common interfaces. And on the south side, the device exposes its proprietary interfaces to the driver. Assuming the driver understands both of these, it, it can translate between them, and that's how we accomplish uh, communications. So as I mentioned, on the transmit side, this is done with uh, a transmit descriptor, which is basically an indication of, of the packet to be transmitted at the actual bytes and some ancillary information which describes additional uh, commands or characteristics about the packet for transmit. So uh, there's also a, a second case, uh, which is on the more on the receive side where the device annotates packets as they come in. So again, the device can indicate a checksum. Uh, XGP hints would be a case where the device is gathering extra information, um, maybe off, offset of IP headers, TCP headers, things like that. And it could put in that in the receive descriptor uh, for consumption by, by the driver. Uh, commands also include sort of configuration or programming commands. So we have things like TC Flower, uh, RTE Flow, uh, might, might be familiar with some of the DPTK folks. Uh, these allow setting up flow state in the device or configuration, but particularly useful on uh, receive when we want to classify packets and, and the device can provide uh, that classification result to the host via the descriptors. Okay, so now let's get into a couple of problems that I think we have with this model. Um, the first one is what I call the narrow waste. And this is an artifact that if we look at that interface between the driver and the device, uh, which is typically over PCIe bus, it is really limiting to us uh, in several ways. Uh, first of all, we have to do uh, PCIe messages the, the descriptors that I've mentioned, they are usually quite limited to the amount of data they can um, expose. Uh, this came up, for instance, in XDP hints, where we realized if, if the device wants to provide, uh, say, full IPv6 addresses and a whole bunch of other information, the proportion of, of data going across the PCIe bus that's overhead, that overhead could eclipse the actual data. So it's a little bit of a um, conundrum. So we have to assume that we don't get this for free. Anytime we move data, uh, it's expensive. So moving data across the bus is, is kind of pricey. 
So that, that's one problem. But the other problem is uh, anytime we deal with state and we have a stateful device, for instance, flow state, those flow states have to be maintained and they have to be maintained across the same interface. So what we've seen in the past is a application that has a very high uh, connection turnover rate. If we're trying to keep up this so-called shadow state in the device to keep it current, then that's additional messages uh, going across the bus. So again, additional overhead. So the upshot of all of this is uh, this kind of forms a narrow waste of functionality where even if the device driver or the device has really elaborate functionality, we still need a way for it to expose that in the host and not to overwhelm us with, with the necessary information to program or configure it. So it is a bit of a, uh, a trick to, to get this right. So the second problem uh, is what I call the black box problem. And this is simply that um, from the host act point of view, and even sometimes even the driver point of view, the device uh, is something of a black box. And this is especially true from, from the host stack. For instance, I, I mentioned LRO. Um, if a device supports LRO, that doesn't necessarily mean that that would be appropriate for, for what the host stack needs. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other additional information you need for LRO to work. In. Um, we would need uh, timers, for instance, and they would need to be configured. We need to understand all the algorithms, uh, how, how they work. Those, unfortunately, are, are more along the black box. But even then, there's, there's actually really simple cases that I've come across recently where we don't actually know what we're getting from a device. And one of the one of the best examples I think is the toplets hash that we get out of you know, set several devices at this point, point. Um, and it's quite useful to to the stack if we can get a four tuple packet hash from the device, the same one that's used in RSS. We can actually use that as the SK buff hash, and the advantage of that is we we get the hash which is used for in several different algorithms in the host stack. But we get the hash in a sense for free. The hash actually does um, is, is sort of expensive to compute on the host. We have to parse the packet on receive. We have to extract the transport uh, ports usually, and then we have to perform uh, uh, Jenkins hash, SIP hash, or Toplets hash, uh, some hash algorithm. So that, that cycles. And if we can get this from the device, that's that's fantastic. But the problem is we don't necessarily know what we're actually getting from the device. And some of this stems from the fact that Linux, unlike uh, Windows, we really don't specify device requirements. Uh, and and there's uh, some historical reasons for that. There's also some, we don't want to, we don't want to have, have to write, um, what do they call it in Windows, the WQLs or whatever. We don't want to have to write that specification. Um, we don't want to have to pigeonhole what the device drivers, device writers do, device vendors do. We want them to innovate. But on the other hand, uh, in the case of the RSS hash, uh, there are cases where the, the algorithm used by the device may not actually fit the characteristics that the host requires. And the host, host requires the following. It, we need a 32-bit hash. It has to be based on four tuple information. It has to be a uniform hash. It has to have good waterfall properties. And it has to have the full 32 bits of entropy. We have a, a working model of that in flow to sector and SK, SKB hash in software. Uh, it's probably the most complete software model to do this. However, it's, it would be really expensive to put in the hardware. So we assume that hardware uh, typically wants to do something lighter weight. But the trade-off there is uh, sometimes hardware may not fit those characteristics and we really don't have an easy way to validate that. So for instance, uh, I've seen one case where there was a proposal uh, to kind of skimp on the number of bits for the hash uh, in the received descriptor because it's expensive real estate and every bit we use in the received descriptor potentially makes the received descriptor larger. 
So we want to compress these as much as possible. Uh, it's really hard to compress a hash because uh, any bit we take out, we lose, lose information. So when we compress that to 32 bits, we're effectively losing 12 bits of entropy. And that can create problems. Uh, if we, if for instance, we just take those uh, 20 bits and we put those into 32 bit hash with a 12, uh, upper 12 bits or zero, if we do normal um, RFS or, or RPS, that's fine because usually we only look at the lower bits. But there are some other algorithms where we do look at the upper bits, like uh, accelerated RFS would do that. So this is kind of kind of example use case. Um, but generally, the device is a black box. We're hoping that some of it gets fixed with uh, the ability to program these devices. Uh, for instance, in the case of, of the RSS hash, if we could actually program the device and make sure that we're getting the full 32 bits out of toplets, that might be useful. So the outcome of this model is the, the narrow uh, waste and the black box. Uh, it really does force offloads as opposed to acceleration. Uh, you can imagine in, in the current model, even trying to accelerate across the P PCIe bus where we're calling individual function blocks out of the device uh, is, would be quite an accomplishment, really difficult to do. Uh, I mentioned the main, main maintain, maintenance of shadow state. So thinking about shadow state, it, it's a pr pretty a big load on this system. And we know that we already on a host, we already have connection states. And the host can have millions because host is usually just limited by its memory, which can be quite large. So anytime we try to establish the shadow state, connection state inside the network or even inside the device, invariably it's a subset, a proper subset of what's on the host. That creates a whole myriad of problems. Um, it, the shadow state becomes a cache of connection states. And as we know, caches in the network are then susceptible to denial of service attacks on, um, on the internet. Uh, we also know that uh, if the cache miss rate becomes too high, then actually having the cache may end up being worse than not having the cache. So it's a whole bunch of things. And obviously there's been a lot of research into this, but um, I don't think we've actually solved this one. So the other offload at our outcome, as I mentioned, we only have a few offloads that really became ubiquitous. Uh, and these are ones that are well suited. Uh, checksum offload is great, but um, even that's elusive to get right. So we've had a long uh, standing request from the vendors to, to provide checksum generic offloads as opposed to checksum specific. Uh, we're getting improvements on that, but uh, there's still a lot of checksum specific offloads um, out there. The, the other thing this drives is at least common denominator. Uh, when, when we have this scenario when we're trying to support uh, so many drivers across this model, it does kind of support the least common denominator, makes it harder to innovate, <clears throat> harder to add to the stack. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of tricky. <clears throat> so I have a couple of general, I don't want to call them solutions, but possibilities for solution spaces. <clears throat> so, excuse me. One concept is what I call split plane acceleration. So this is the manifestation of how to get acceleration at a lower level. And what it really requires is a tighter coupling between the low level software and the hardware directly. So I, I don't think we can necessarily do this in the current model. and um, really going to be hard to do on servers, but thinking about something like SmartNix, where the the device is a closed environment, um, we can address it as a domain specific architecture, which means we could could in fact break down some of these barriers. So we're not necessarily stuck, for instance, between the application CPUs and a SmartNix and the co-located hardware. We're not necessarily stuck with the the canonical device driver interface. We could actually do something different. 
and we could actually allow more of a functional interface uh, where the hardware exposes uh, the blocks um, and the low level software could be programmable, consume that information. And because it is like something like a smart NIC, there's still, we're still exposed to the host uh, using the normal interfaces. But in this way, and, and this also supports um, more of a, a device data path programming model. In this way, we could uh, get some more of the advantages of acceleration, at least at a lower layer, layer and reduce the, um, the load. So uh, in order to do this, uh, we would want to kind of split this between uh, control plane and data plane. Uh, I use those terms reluctantly because uh, the second we, we say, uh, oh, connection setup, that's a control plane function. And then uh, somebody comes along and shows that we have a TCP send attack. So it turns out uh, that connection setup is actually data plane, um, meaning it's fast path. But uh, we still have some concept of this. So for instance, uh, TCP timers and, and what have you could be running more of a control plane. And then the data plane, data path would be more of an optimized um, data path. So if we want to get to the hundreds of millions of packets per second going through TCP, we really need uh, this sort of optimizations and, and TCP to take advantage directly of, of hardware accelerations. Uh, between these, we um, would really want to have a, a tightly coupled almost um, uh, asynchronous multiprocessing system. So between the control and the, and the data plane, uh, have that shared state. So this eliminates the uh, problem of shadow state. So control and data share the same TCP state, for instance, and they both can operate on it. But they're, they're different parts of the same stack, uh, optimized for different aspects of the stack. And then that gets us into the need for message queues between these and, and other, other sorts of queues. So a lot of this I think could be also hardware accelerated. For instance, message queues um, would be nice to have, have accelerated. So the result of this, uh, this creates a much wider waste. So the hardware can um, provide access to granular IP blocks and now if it has a crypto function, the data, data plane, for instance, can call that crypto function directly. If it provides uh, some sort of hash acceleration, hash computation, the uh, data plane can call that, um, et cetera. So we've, we've accomplished that. Uh, and since we're moving the hardware interface much lower, that also means we're moving the software, which uh, potentially is accessible to the stack much lower also. So a lot of the things that we've talked about that a device would do, for instance, going back to the LRO case, if we were able to program LRO in simple C code, uh, but it runs at hardware speed, that, that's a huge advantage because now the stack can actually see what the algorithms are, can see how the timers work, can see how we deal with, with packet holes, um, has control over that. When there's a bug, we fix it. So there's a huge advantage. Um, and I think a lot of this is already known through, through the efforts to make devices more programmable. But I think one aspect of that is we, we eliminate this black box. And once we do that, that will open up more of the device capabilities to the rest of the stack. Uh, with that, um, are there any questions? Okay, uh, so I did see one question, white box approach. Uh, only works with smart NICs. I think that's, for the time being, that's the obvious um, entry point uh, because smart NICs pr um, create this closed system. But the, the thing about the canonical device driver model, um, it really is like 50 years old. And we based uh, TTYs on it uh, way back when. So we've kind of evolved that model. It's quite embedded. And it does have a lot of usefulness because it, it does allow us to support so many, so many drivers. Fundamentally changing that model on the server side is going to be really, uh, really tricky. What kind of functional interface we want to use, a memory map DMA for a user space app. 
and move all hardware specific code to user app? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, and I think there's a couple of ways to, to look at that. So hardware specific code, let, let's assume that means uh, the programming for device of some fashion, uh, whether that be uh, some sort of C code, offload to DBPF, uh, P4, that is clearly the code itself is, is written by, by users and we want the model where the users can download uh, the code into the hardware, do it in safely, provide the environment and the hooks for that. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily uh, memory mapping from user space, uh, but it's more, there, there could be a download function. So the assumption there is programming is, is not a continuous thing. We don't have to reprogram the device for every new flow, for instance. So if we can program the device once, uh, that works. But we do need still um, some high performance interfaces between the, the host and the device. I'm hoping that, that CXL, um, the emergence of CXL devices help with that. Could you give an example of a functional interface to accelerators? Uh, yes. So I will be talking about uh, BP4 on Monday. And that is uh, write C code and get it accelerated. That's, that's kind of the goal. Um, and it has to be a little more than C code. It, it needs to be C code designed for that sort of acceleration. And the, the code can be written by the user or, 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 or not. Uh, what we will need there is sort of a common, common interface into these device functions. And what I'm hoping there is that if we can get this to be a software problem where we're writing code, that it really becomes a compiler problem in order to translate that code into what the hardware um, accelerates and completely eliminate uh, the need for like SDKs and um, even the NPU model. So we have the, the compiler handles that, so we write a plain somewhat generic C code that is um, specialized for the networking problem with things like acceleration. And when the compiler uh, sees, for instance, uh, a call to the encrypt uh, data block function, it can map that into whatever instructions it needs to uh, in the target. Are you promoting different device types that connect to and bypass different layers of the kernel stack? Uh, not really. Um, I, th I think uh, this, this has a little less to do with the kernel stack. Um, it, it really is, I think we need to think in terms of the stack. So for instance, in the control plane, data plane um, model, if we prefer split in those, uh, if, if you followed, for instance, TCP offload engines and why they basically failed, it was because they tried to hard code a full TCP stack in a hardware, uh, had nothing to do with any normal uh, C stacks or, or networking stacks and became very much um, kind of proprietary. So we couldn't change them, we couldn't program them. So if I was doing this, I, I obviously want to leverage the, the Linux TCP stack as much as possible. So all of the work we've done in congestion control, uh, connection management, statistics, I'd want to leverage that. But what I want is I want to take out kind of the, the fast data path um, for TCP. The, the part where um, back in the 1990s, Van Jacobsen had a famous um, blurb where he said he could, he could implement TCP receive and 30 CPU instructions. Take that out, abstract that out. That's the fast data path. So, so when packets are coming in order uh, without a problem, then we, we can fly, we can do our 100 million packets per second over TCP. Uh, that presumes that we have a, a high-speed connection lookup, we have uh, high-speed parsers. Uh, it, it does assume a lot, of, a lot of different things, but in the end of the day, we still retain the fact that this is still part of the, the Linux stack in some fashion. 
um, even if it's even if it's kind of co-located on a different CPU, uh, it still interacts with that. But the the model allows us to to put the code in such that um, it is accelerated. And there there was a uh, some kind of pointers to this um, a while back. I posed a thing called TXDP Transport XDP, where the idea was that we push some of the uh, transport functionality down into XDP, but also that we expose the the output from something like XDP at a much higher layer. So, for instance, in the case of TCP, I'd like to see that in the device, uh, in a programmable device, we can do all of the IP processing on the pack a packet. We can do all the TCP processing. We can actually do the connection lookup and get the result. All of that can be done without needing any state, without any, needing any of the uh, advanced TCP protocol algorithm. Once we have all the information, I'd like to jump straight into the stack processing at the received TCP packet in established state. Uh, the device gave us everything. If we can trust the device because it's um, white box, we can trust that it gave us the right thing and, and it's part of the stack so we don't have to worry about the, the um, trust model. So I think that from that point of view, that's what I'd like to see. Uh, so so uh, yeah, uh, so I'm very familiar with uh, the Netronome models, uh, P4 and C. Uh, like I said, uh, let's um, also talk about BP4. I think it's, uh, in some sense, it, it kind of combines the best of these. What was that? Tom, I think it was next actually before that question. Okay. Can I, okay. So can I make? I don't know how much how you're doing on time. I can ask a question or just let it off. Uh, I think I, I need to wrap it up in, in once maybe one more question. Uh, yeah. So in regards to the you you, you mentioned these hash. I think you saw those patches on on the list. Uh, first of all, there's a talk tomorrow the TC workshop on this. It's a inter very interesting uh, approach. Uh, what, what it ends up looking like is you have a hierarchical model. The NIC is, you can look at the NIC as a totally different host or different node in the, in, in the graph of packet processing. You have to program it differently. If you're programming, you have to know what that 32-bit hash means when, uh, when you receive it in the kernel. If it says, what, what does 1234 mean, will depend on what computation happened in this, uh, uh, on the NIC. Uh, so if you're RSS, that's probably well understood. Uh, even with RSS, you can probably mix up the salt or whatever the uh, the keys are, and one, two, three, four could have very different meanings as to what tuple is actually being matched. So I, I, I think the model to scale, uh, you, you'd have to do the separation and have and have hierarchical model uh, with a different computer. Just think of it as a network, basically. Uh, uh, you know, uh, to reduce the amount of effort or computational effort to be done on the host, you need to um, to tell the smart NIC what you want it to match, give you a 32-bit idea that it's much faster lookup or parsing on uh, on the cover. So, um, so I do have, so, so with regards to TC, TC Workshop, uh, I do have some concepts about generic TC Flower, um, which I can bring up there, which uh, extends this work so one of the one of the problems that we have with TC Flower is uh, it, it's based on the kernel flow dissector, which, as we know, is quite fixed. And one of the side effects, especially BP4, I want to undo that um, staticness and make it make it more dynamic. On the hash, uh, that's an interesting problem in itself. So one of the requests that we had in some of the XDP advanced XDP discussions, it would be really nice if the device could return not just a hash, but could return a unique token per flow. And, uh, and I think thinking about it, the, the obvious way to do that is, well, we need to create a flow state in the device and then associate that flow state with um, maybe, uh, maybe a random value, or it could even be the, uh, the pointer to the connection block um, state on, on the host. That, that would work, but that gets us into the problem. We have to have all this flow state. 
So I was actually thinking there might be an opportunity to do something simple here, which I haven't had time to work on, but what if we just simply uh, went, instead of using 32-bit hashes, went to 64-bit hashes uh, in the device. So if we have a full 64-bit hash and we give that to the host, the odds of a collision between two flows that two unrelated flows with a 64-bit hash becomes like once every 100 years or something like that. Whereas with 32-bit hash, it was once every month, um, assuming like a million flows per device. So basically we hit the birthday, uh, birthday paradox. So uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of still wondering about that. If, if we can get away with uh, doubling the hash size that substantially increases the uniqueness of these such that we might be actually able to use these as like almost guaranteed unique uh, identifiers of, of the connection up to maybe some most secure secure applications obviously but uh, so yeah I think there's a lot of generally a lot of opportunity here. The topic that we want to talk about is um, uh, you know some uh, different uh, view on switch dev and port representers and stuff like that uh, and, and this idea came to us from the feedback that we got from community uh, on uh, certain patches that were posted uh, like in the last month or so, I would say. Um, and so, um, you know, we first want to explain what is the challenge that we are having and then uh, the solution space. Um, uh, Steve, next slide. Okay, so um, with that, I'm going to let Steve do the talking here, and then I will come back uh, a little later uh, with some discussion. Okay, so uh, I'll first uh, like recap the problem we were facing because that's all the all the ba uh, basic uh, before we sending the patch. And um, so if we are uh, revisiting the problem we were facing. Um, mainly we have three problems. So the first of all is we are trying to enable the device for some work, <clears throat> workload and the workload is typically to steering the traffic. And so we know we, we want to offload the flow, uh, like program the flow on the device and the steering the traffic. Uh, but the traffic is uh, uh, like, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's Mario telecom protocols and even some protocols is customized protocols which means that that is not uh, uncertain. That's an uncertain protocols. And there, um, so yeah, uh, as Tom said, so in the Linux, uh, TC support fix, uh, fixed fields, but it, that means that we need upgrade their or updates or modified kernel frequently and they're enforced to uh, update uh, uh, the kernel because our the application needs, to, uh, needs that function. Uh, and the last one is uh, even um, because it's going to address some uh, the, the uh, day plan functions. So, but uh, in terms of the uh, flow offload, you know, um, day plan function need to resolve the slow parse exception and then uh, update the flow. So the, uh, the flow update rate becomes higher and higher. Then that uh, comes about the third problems. So that's the three fundamental problem we are facing if we want to offload flows. And then we, we try to solve this, right? And uh, in, in history, also, like, the, the most state, uh, straightforward way is we, we take the entire device uh, from kernel, like, uh, for, like we are using DBK to uh, like take the full functional PF and enable everything, data pass, control pass, and, our, and, our, and forward workload to enable that. Uh, that is a good playground for us to explore their common patterns and uh, summarize that. But the, there's a, uh, the most significant cons is uh, you, we all lose their hoster network connect, uh, connection, manageability, and the, the stable access. So this is not good for, the, for any of the production. So we, we are trying, uh, trying the better solution is that we always uh, like uh, uh, have their kernel uh, to take over the PF. And the application. So here, the control plan application is relative. So this is not really control plan application. Now, when we have a data plan application, uh, 
uh, when we offload the uh, flows uh, sharing and the forwarding logic into hardware, then the application remains, application is take over the exception and handle the slow pass. So on that perspective, we would call it a uh, uh, control plan. Uh, um, we, 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 we try to limit that application only on the VF, on the trust VF. Um, but we expect it to program the steering flow for others because we want to redirect flows for, for the workloads for the other, other uh, VNF. So, um, and there, uh, if we're doing that, so it shows that, uh, so any pro, uh, pre-programmed flows for PF traffic, uh, we, we will enforce it to infrastructure management and uh, that will share kernel with uh, other hoster applications, agents and et cetera. That's for the management, uh, infrastructure management. And then we expect the problem uh, uh, to, to, to program that uh, advanced flows for, uh, uh, from that assigned trust VF uh, to, uh, for those uh, cross-function traffic. That's for uh, now uh, applications. Uh, and the baseline is advanced processing hardware assistant. And then how we cooperate with just these problems. We, we, we do want to kind of to manage the device and uh, maintain their uh, like stability, uh, manageability, but we want to launch our now application. That application is for like uh, for, for next slice. Like I take a, like this as a quick sample. So uh, this is a, like the gateway in the uh, wireless edge. Uh, so basically this is our like multi, uh, 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 multi-service uh, edge computing. So, so on that part, we see there's a node, uh, our network middle box, which is a UPF. UPF is our gateway. And then it will redirect traffic. So there's a different kind of traffic. So for the control plan uh, nodes, it's N4. And uh, then N6 is our typical uh, for the, um, the data network. And then it, it uh, locally, they have a local, uh, local data uh, network, local area data network to host a lot of application. This application not necessarily being a network function. It could be a normal application for media processing for, for video and et cetera. So UPF is acting as a gateway. So when um, the MEC platform uh, comes to, uh, like when, when anyone takes our MEC platform, this is a normal NV platform. You have an infrastructure uh, for computing, for network and for storage. Then you launch our launch our network, uh, network application. This is a UPF gateway. Um, uh, then actually the entire platform um, delegates the data plan to the UPF. So when the UPF start to like offload the flow to the to the hardware, it needs to update the flow. So the flow uh, is not only to handle the packet that belong to the UPF itself, um, uh, but also need to uh, steering traffic across different uh, nodes, non nodes, uh, different sandbox to different application in, in the sandbox. So this is the like one example. So uh, if we this UPF um, given our if we give our VF and assign our VF to this UPF, but this uh, now functions need to program the traffic across the. So uh, what uh, you know okay, okay. We, uh, we are bringing up here is uh, you know Steve explained the problem uh, you know uh, the discussion started on this path series uh, where uh, you know uh, we took a little bit of a different approach first and from that we uh, brought in some learning as to like what we want to do uh, uh, we did not really introduce in this path series any impact to the common framework. Uh, PF kernel driver still remains uh, the device uh, has the device ownership and resolves any conflict, and it just supports the negotiation of advanced flow programming capabilities, uh, and and uh, you know talking to the device using sideband messages. But you know uh, you know based on the feedback we got from Jakob, there were some uh, you know learnings that we took back and incorporated those. Uh, what we believe is. Um, uh, if we were to take this and uh, uh, problem and uh, you know run switch dev and uh, TC framework on top of a trusted VF, 
uh, it will solve at least few of our problems. So as follows, right? So um, we will be able to, uh, I'll go from bottom um, because the third one is what gets addressed, um, which is separation of the control plane kernel from hosting kernel, which provides the independence and different rate of change uh, between the two kernels, because we want a stable kernel for the for the hosting uh, uh, purposes uh, and and uh, you know the hypervisor running there, but we want a much higher rate of change on the kernel, uh, you know taking the latest um, kernel patches for where the slow path or the exception path data plane runs and the control application runs. Um, I mean, as Tom uh, pointed out, it, it's still data plane there. It's not really uh, control plane. It's just the control plane application that is running in that kernel. Um, uh, so that definitely gets solved. Um, if we run the switch dev and port representer on top of a trusted VF, uh, what doesn't get solved is, um, uh, you know, right now we are uh, using TC Flower in conjunction with SwitchDev and TC, which relies on named fields, uh, does not really help with uh, the new or unknown protocol problem. And I think, uh, you know, as uh, Tom proposes uh, his TC generic uh, solution in the later presentation, I think that would be a good way to kind of uh, move forward to address that problem. Uh, so that, uh, you know, the kernel kind of, um, uh, the flow dissector can actually be not fixed, but m adapts better uh, to the, to the, you know, different new protocols that, that are being used. Um, and uh, yeah, name fields with TC Flower is, puts us in a very protocol dependent flow dissector. And that can really hinder with, um, you know, uh, in, in certain areas where protocol innovation is the key. Uh, and then um, uh, there is the, the, the second problem, which is really high flow programming rate from control plane. Um, and this one is still not uh, solved as far as we can see. There are a lot of efforts going on. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, there is, you know, the AFXDP for control plane. There is uh, enhanced, uh, you know, uh, some work that was done in the last two years with, uh, you know, uh, from lots of folks to improve the TC performance itself for, for, uh, for flow programming rate, but it is still nowhere close to what is expected in these uh, telco-like environments where the rate of programming expectation is one to 10 million flows, uh, flow rates, and on, uh, you know, from, uh, uh, you know, couple of cores. And so, so that's, that's the, you know, still the area that we need to, um, uh, you know, as a community, we need to innovate. Um, uh, but at the same time, like, you know, we at least think this addresses uh, the proposal addresses the separating the control plane or separating the slow path data plane from the fast path uh, and, and uh, you know, gives them different speeds of growth in terms of um, innovation because the innovation on the, uh, the control plane side is a lot uh, higher than what is happening on the, the hosting side where, you know, you, you, you want more stability. Um, Steve, let's go to the next slide. So this is this is um, pretty much the separation that we are hoping. So there is a switch dev and port represent on top of a trusted VF, uh, and this is running either in a separate kernel or you know uh, some other kind of isolation. Separate kernel really helps, as I said, um, and and then we have uh, the stable kernel, which is um, uh, you know providing, uh, you know, the VMs for uh, uh, either service appliances or for hosting purposes itself. Um, and, uh, you know, what is not really shown here is, uh, you know, the stable host management PF, uh, the traffic rules for those are pre-programmed uh, so that it is, you always have your connectivity to the, um, to the host, 
uh, but the rest of the flow steering is is programmed through this uh, trusted VF uh, so that it can be uh, quite flexible uh, to decide what kind of traffic is going to the other VFs. Uh, uh, next slide, Steve. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, what we want to say is delegate switch dev to trusted VF that runs separate control plane uh, kernel or app, uh, plus application responsible for hardware offloading or using hardware acceleration um, uh, for both, uh, uh, you know, uh, exception handling as well as for, um, you know, uh, control plane rule programming. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, we need to definitely ad address the performance and flexibility problem with kernel. Uh, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, XDP and eBPF efforts have helped for sure, uh, uh, but that is not enough to solve the NAV performance problem, you know, uh, because as I said, there is still, a, you know, a magnitude of difference that is there over there. And um, uh, the other part that I want to mention is, uh, you know, although we say it's a control plane separation. It's actually a separation of the data plane, the data plane that is in the device and the data plane that is, uh, uh, you know, in the uh, the kernel that is running on top uh, of the, uh, in the VM that is running on top of the trusted VF. Uh, so, and that, even though we call it a slow path, it's kind of a, uh, oxymoron, that's where the performance actually is needed. So it's not really a slow path. Um, it's an exception path for sure. And, and that's the split data plane, uh, one that is going directly to the, uh, to the, uh, the VM uh, from the device and the other that is going through uh, these um, cores that are de dedicated to this VM that where uh, your control plane application is running. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, the last named fields with TCFlower did not help in the space. So generic TC, uh, I think, you know, Tom is going to talk about it. Uh, so our request is basically create a pathway first uh, for supporting this model. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that will really help us contribute back to kernel uh, when we have this pathway. Um, um, to build upon. So yeah, so definitely the feedback really helped. Uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, I think we still need uh, parts of those patches to uh, implement the separation. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, we can move to questions. Okay, I'll, I'll set an example. Okay. Good this job. is how you unmute and then you turn on your video so that uh, it can be recorded on YouTube. Uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, you are proposing this trusted VF. There's only going to be one on the host, or this or what if you have multiple tenants, for example? Yeah, so I think for now, the what we're looking at is a single trusted uh, VF because we want. Uh, you know, s single traffic controller, let's just say it that way. Uh, there can be a case where you may have an active failover kind of situation, uh, mm -hmm. but then at a time, this is, uh, this is basically saying a single traffic controller is, 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 is uh, less confusion and less chaos. I, I was actually going to just make one comment to add to what Jamal said, right? Like in, in the case of a Nick, I think, the one controller model makes a lot of sense, but if you, since this is in the switched up context, and you, if you really are going to have a controlling VF, which really is a PF function, so it's sort of you want to delegate, so you want to do a VF. I get that, but then I think you have to create that, just like you have a VF to PF mapping function. I think you will have to do much more and create a controlling VF to control VF mapping function. And it could be a, it has to be an end to end, right? It can't be one to end. 
Yeah, so definitely that feedback is valid, uh, um, uh, Shurjit. Uh, what we are doing right now, I think it helps us to keep one controller, but you know, it it, it is something that uh, we need to consider for you know uh, future use cases where uh, you know you might want to separate your uh, traffic control functionality into uh, you know uh, uh, you know multiple such. Um, um, VMs or containers, whatever, that uh, do their pieces, right? So, so yeah. So, I mean, uh, that's good feedback. I will, you know, we'll have to think through as, if there is a need for doing that. So, one other point on switch dev is that we are trying to not use the PF as a host in that device anymore. Uh, it has its representer port so that it can be configured, but that's the uplink port, that's the cable port itself and not a net device on the host side. If the host needs networking uh, out of a switch dev, it should be using a VF for itself. It, it, you, you're saying uh, reverse it, the PF should be the one who which should be running the switch dev and uh, another VF should be uh, providing the host connectivity. Is that, uh, did, did you say that? Sorry, maybe I misunderstand. If I got you right, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, so I'll answer the question, right? Why we cannot do that? It's a chicken and egg problem, right? If I use a VF for host connectivity, the VF comes later than the PF. And and, and so uh, I, I, the, the stable connectivity can only be achieved through a PF that exists before uh, you know the egg is is born, so the chicken has to be there. So 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 uh, yeah. So I we need that PF, and we need fixed rules for directing the traffic to the PF, so that you know um, its its connectivity is always maintained, and then the VF itself uh, provides the flexibility of steering packets to other VFs. Right. So, so, and, and this, uh, you know, the, the issue with the control plane application is also this, that, as I said, it, it rates much faster rate than the rest of the stuff, which is, needs to be stable. Plus, uh, you know, you also have things like, you know, you want to do updates on that control plane application. And for that uh, reason, it can have, you know, microseconds or milliseconds of, uh, you know, uh, no connectivity, and that's perfectly okay for certain systems. But losing connectivity to the server itself or the other VMs is, is uh, not an option in most cases. Okay, so um, let's move on to. Uh, some of the que uh, uh, questions and open um, mic. So uh, uh, Mache posed a question. Um, I can uh, I can repeat it. I think that it's pretty uh, interesting. So someone will answer the question. What are the absolute minimum offloads a network adapter must support for good UDP TCP performance? Uh, assuming that uh, receive transmit checksum offload and scatter gather optionally TSO and more optionally hardware grow. Um, but it would be nice to get an explanation for why we still have brand new Wi-Fi chipsets with no offloads. So I think there's a, a couple of um, couple of points there and I think the community um, uh, can answer a lot of that. Uh, for the first part of that question, um, it's kind of a loaded question in a sense, right? So what is the minimal offloads and network must support for good TCP performance? I mean, first thing is what's good TCP, perform TCP performance? So we have to realize that that's um, heavily dependent on the environment. And then what, what, are you, what, what are you trying to optimize in that? Is this uh, throughput? Is it latency? Is it connection um, set up teardown? Is it power on the device? So uh, there's a lot, a lot to that, obviously. Um, going back to my presentation, it's pretty clear that there are a few checks, you know, a few offloads like checksum offload that we consider to be critical, but um, whether or not there's other forms of offloads that, that help this, then 
that's an interesting question. Um, the, the part about Wi-Fi chipsets with no, no offloads, uh, I, that's also kind of interesting because uh, one of the applications that, I don't know if this is actually happening, but, but I've heard about is um, on a uh, mobile device, the biggest problem there isn't actually performance in terms of packets per second or, or throughput or latency, but power. And the question there becomes, how can we offload uh, TCP functionality to improve power? And one of the ideas, and I think um, Eric Dumasay might have some work on this in his uh, SINs in XDP, SIN processing in XDP. Uh, if we can offload things like uh, receiving SIN or TCP keep alive, if we can push those down into XDP and then subsequently push those down into device, uh, once you push those down into device, then we should be able to process packets in the TCP data path completely without even waking up the CPU. So I, I think the answer to this question is um, there's a lot of answers. And, uh, you know, I'll open it up to, uh, if anyone else in the community has uh, points about this. Tom, I, I have, uh, you know, some generic, um, uh, you know, thoughts that I captured when um, you were presenting and maybe I'll try to talk to that. So, uh, you know, we did talk about offloads and acceleration. I just want to add to that. There is real good um, value to the generic offloads and, and, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really key. And I think you have been emphasizing that for a very long time where, uh, you know, all the generic checksum offload or uh, generic segmentation offload or whatever. Um, uh, so in my, in, uh, from, from my point of view, generic, uh, you know, equals something which is protocol agnostic and there is no fixed configuration um, in hardware that uh, controlling software cannot change. So that's how I, I kind of, think about generic um, uh, and they're re needed both on the host side and on the switch side, not just, um, you know, uh, whenever we kind of talk about generic offers, we pretty much, uh, uh, you know, limit to what you mentioned, which is uh, from Maciej's angle, you know, the, the checksum offload or hash or uh, um, segmentation offload or uh, co-leasing or, um, you know, uh, things of that nature, but I think there are a lot of generic offloads that are needed on the switch side as well, um, and and they might be a different set than you know the four or five that we talk about uh, most of the time. Uh, and then there is uh, also the importance of generic blocks in the pipe. Uh, ultimately, you know the hardware design for packet processing. There is uh, you know just uh, two kind of uh, uh, things that are going on. One is, um, uh, you know, memory optimizations. Uh, and when I say memory optimizations, basically doing a very context aware um, algorithms to kind of decide what is in near memory and what is in far memory. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and that, is, that is a key and that is, uh, you know, uh, knowledge about what uh, the networking flows might look like or, uh, you know, uh, the nature of those flows or whatever, uh, you know, and that's where most of the innovation from a hardware vendor comes from in deciding A, the sizes of those near and far memory and B, uh, you know, algorithms that decides what remains in the near memory versus what goes to the far memory. Um, of course, I mean, this, this comes into play only if we assume there is, um, you know, uh, flows that are offloaded into the hardware, unlike uh, the model that you were talking about, where, you know, you would rather have a larger hash, which is stateless, than, uh, you know, have a, a flow rule in the hardware. But, you know, in some cases, it's unavoidable. But, I mean, I, I really like a larger hash thing because it's so much more scalable. Uh, uh, and scalability is, 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 ultimately what decides everything uh, for a data center, right? So, uh, so um, 
and, and the second part that I said, uh, you know, for a hardware uh, vendor, uh, memory optimization is one part and the second part is network or IO atomic operations. And I think you covered that one as well, which is like, we really need some of these stateless IO uh, operations, you know, checksum or CRC32 or hash or whatever. Um, and then there is, there are some which are stateful like crypto and compression and whatnot. And we'll have to look into those as well. Um, uh, the other key factors for, uh, for, for hardware design or hardware offload or acceleration design is modularity, just like um, there is in software. Um, and, 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 you know, the good part is, um, uh, and, and I, I can t speak from my experience, doing software first and then going into hardware design, uh, you know, uh, coming from the same thought process that, uh, you know, that modularity needs to be maintained uh, throughout the pipe, whether it is, it is uh, the pipeline data, data plain pipeline running in software versus in hardware. Um, that really decides whether you're building uh, a hardware uh, that is going to last two, three years or many more years. Um, and then um, the other angle that I, I would say from a hardware vendor's perspective, perspective is um, a quality of a hardware. I mean, we pretty much uh, look at it in a very short term or in a very, uh, you know, um, the tests that we have designed, like the, you know, test kits and everything or, uh, or um, uh, benchmarks that we have designed. Uh, they're, they are designed in a way that they focus on uh, uh, a given deployed protocol, right? And, and, and hardware vendors can take shortcuts and optimize just for that protocol. But that... And, and, really, Angela, yeah. So, so for the sake of time, um, I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt you here. Uh, uh, so the, the second part of um, Masvi's question was basically asking about aggregation, what to do about it. Uh, both cellular and USB adapters appear to often mem copy everything to do non GSO style packet aggregation, deaggregation. Um, so this is this is obviously a long standing topic. Uh, we have really good capabilities in software to do uh, GSO and GRO. Um, even even before we talk about hardware, there's a lot of value in just having that in software. It, it actually solves a large per percentage of the problem. And like I said, even something like, like TSO and LRO are difficult to do in hardware. Uh, but the interesting question is, and, and I think we're gonna get to this in some other topics, um, what about other, other forms of batching? And Batching is, is a little broader topic where if we collect packets together, can we operate them on them as a, a single entity, even if they're not exactly the same flow or, or same, um, same connection? And we can look at some other, I mean, there's, there's been some work here. I think XDP uh, batching has been uh, a topic that we've talked about a lot, uh, but there's also something interesting uh, in VPP and DPDK uh, I'm not entirely convinced that, that that's for Linux, for instance, but it does have some interesting aspects on batching packets together that kind of have similar characteristics but aren't exactly the same flow. So uh, maybe if, uh, if anyone wants to comment on this uh, topic. Tom, there's okay. also cases of batching when we do the defrag, um, uh, spe uh, especially in the telco cases where, uh, you know, it, it, it is not always avoidable, uh, the you know, fragmentation. Right, so I guess the question more is along the lines, what, what can, what's the direction for hardware acceleration in this if we wanna go beyond, well, assuming that we get the basic segmentation offloads reasonably accelerated. Okay, so uh, with that, it's now uh, 9.30, so time flies. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers. I think uh, this, this was pretty good.
uh, obviously we'll have to fine tune the question and answer a bit, um, how we deal with that. Uh, but with that, uh, we can adjourn. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>